That night at Fazbear's Frights passed without incident, and Hudson was so relaxed when he went home after his shift that he actually went to sleep and stayed asleep for five hours. He returned to his job late in the morning, just in time to watch Barry and Duane unload a coffin-sized wood crate from their truck and carry it inside the building. Accepting the keyring from Virgil, Hudson trotted up the front steps of the building and watched his friends carry the box down the hall. What is that? Hudson called out. Come and see, Duane said. It's going to be mind-blowing. You won't believe where this was found. Hudson looked his locked Sorry, Hudson hooked his keys on his belt and followed his friends. Where are we going? Hudson asked. The inner hall, Barry directed. That's where they want it. Get this, Duane said. This was found inside a hidden room in one of the pizzerias. Yeah, it's definitely Springtrap. Barry smiled. Faith is really excited about it. She said there's going to be, uh, they're going to put it in a hidden room here now. And it's going to be the best feature of the whole attraction. Hudson looked down at his nightstick and adjusted it so Barry wouldn't see how flushed his face was. Is she here now? Hudson asked as casually as he could. It must have sounded good because Barry just as casually replied, no, she's spending the day shopping for fabric and paint or whatever to go with this new prop. While they talked, Barry and Duane grunted and shuffled their way down the long hall. It didn't occur to Hudson to offer help. He was too busy thinking about Faith to be, for to be thoughtful. He noticed the hallway was free of boxes in this section. More character parts had been added to the walls. He thought there were at least a dozen or more new pairs of eyes peering out from the walls. Barry and Duane dropped the crate on the linoleum with a res resounding thud. Sorry, Hudson flinched. Sure, he heard on the heels of the thud a metallic sound coming from inside the crate. Duane plopped his butt on the, on the crate and wiped sweat from his face with the hem of his t-shirt. I left the crowbar near Pirate's Cove, Barry said. I'll go get it. You're not going to open that, are you? Hudson asked. What? Duane asked. Don't tell me you're afraid of what's in this box. He looked up at Hudson. You think we haven't noticed how jumpy you are around this stuff? You're letting this weirdness... He waved a hand around the walls. Get to you. And... That's your choice, man, but you're living into the power of suggestion, basic psychology. What you expect is what happens, self-fulfilling prophecy and all that. I know you took psych too, Barry. Remember the experiments they did that proved that, when, that what you see when you look at things in the world depends not as much on what's actually there, but more on the assumptions you're making when you look at things. Remember? Sure, Barry said, but it's not for you to tell Hudson. Hudson touched Barry's arm. It's okay. He kept his face nonchalant and said... I need to go on my rounds. He strode away, but he could hear Barry talking as he did. You could be a real jerk, you know that, Barry said. What did I do? Duane asked, sounding genuinely baffled. Of course, he wouldn't get it. Duane, as far as Hudson knew, had never been afraid of anything in his life. He was always the first one to jump off the roof when they were trying to fly, always the first one out on the ice to check the pond for ice skating, always the first one to charge into a fight to break it up on the playground. Barry was no slouch at being courageous either. He once got a $1,000 reward from an old lady when he climbed a 100-foot tree to rescue the woman's cat. And Hudson? What had he done? He'd hid from Lewis instead of fighting back. Hudson shook himself mentally and stomped down the hall to do his rounds. A half hour later, Hudson was on his way to the office when Duane called to him. You have to come and see this thing. It is creeptastic. Leave him alone, Barry said. Oh, come on. It's not a demon. It's an old animatronic. A whole animatronic. It's amazing. Look at the detail. Hudson wanted nothing but to go to the office, shut the door, lock it, and take a nap. But he wasn't going to give Duane the satisfaction, so he strolled down the hall as if he couldn't care less about what was in the crate. When he reached his friends, he stopped dead trying to wrestle the animatronic upright and get it propped against the wall. Barry and Duane had their arms around the most bizarre-looking thing Hudson had ever seen. Right, bizarre. He was using that word because using the word terrifying would mean that he was afraid, and he was afraid. But he sure didn't want to admit it to anyone, including himself. Hudson called on an old trick he'd used when Lewis was on a rampage. He narrowed his eyes until his focus was almost down to a pinpoint. He'd learned when he was young 
that when your perspective was that narrow, what you were facing wasn't as horrifying. Using that pinpoint focus, all Hudson could see, propped between Barry and Duane, was a set of white star staring eyes with heavy green lids. That was enough to freak Hudson out. But it was also a small enough part of the thing that his friends were wrestling with that he could act uh, relaxed and unconcerned. Testing that theory, he spoke. What are you doing with it? Dancing? His voice sounded normal and light. He congratulated himself. Faith wants the thing standing here against this wall, Barry said. He grunted and shifted his side of the life-size animatronic. Did you get these hooks attached? He asked Duane. Or are you just going to flirt with it? Dwayne pulled a couple hooks out of his pocket. You hold your side in place. I'll lean against my side and I'll attach the hooks to the wall. Then we'll, sit, then we'll switch places and set up the other side. I'll leave you to it, Hudson said, turning to go to the office. Want to go for dinner after work? Uh, Barry called out. Hudson stopped and looked back. I can't. Sorry. Virgil isn't coming in this evening. I'll be here until tomorrow morning. Sorry, Dwayne said. Sucks to be you. Thanks for that. Hudson said, shaking his head. I'm just saying, Duane said, maybe the seals can teach you not to stick your foot in your mouth, Barry said to Duane as Hudson was walking away. Hudson fully expected to have an easy night of it. In spite of the addition of the new animatronic, he was feeling good when he closed the building up for the night. Maybe pretending to be relaxed was actually making him feel more relaxed. He figured he could make the self-fulfilling prophecy thing work for him, and it did, until he decided to poke the bear, and that was when he got all courageous and resolved to face his fears. He'd spent the rest of the night paying for it. Normally, Hudson did his rounds in the same direction and the same order, but tonight he was eager. So he started at the end, intending to reverse his usual direction. This brought him to the new animatronic near the beginning of his circuit instead of the end. As he approached the scruffy thing, he planned to face it right off and get it out of the way. He was going to rob it of its power to upset him. Good plan, but he forgot to squint his eyes, and he wasn't planning on the thing talking to him either. Hudson strode down the inner wall, and he found a new animatronic hooked to the wall just where Duane, uh, Duane, Duane and Barry left it. Posed in a friendly hand-up-to-wave position, the animatronic's posture wasn't threatening, but really anything that looked like this was threatening, no matter what it was doing. Hudson faced the animatronic, then stumbled back and sucked in his breath. What in the world was this thing supposed to be? At first glance, the robotic character attached to the wall appeared to be a rabbit, sort of, with fur of greenish-yellow. This was no ordinary rabbit. Though not even a cartoon rabbit, it was the kind of rabbit Dr. Frankenstein might have created if he'd wanted to build a rabbit instead of a man. Ears torn, dozens of pieces of the bodies and limbs, uh, and limbs, uh, yellow-green fur stripped away or chewed away. It was hard to tell. This was a rabbit that would never be cuddled by any child. It shouldn't have seen by, it been seen by a child either. Where the fur was torn, you could see metal pieces of the animatronic structure, exposed wires linked to an oxidized metal frame and something else. What was that? Hudson couldn't help himself. He leaned in to take a better look. Was that? No, it can't be. He studied the reddish and grayish areas that could be seen through the gaps in the fur and metal. It looked like... Hudson took a step back and clutched at his nightstick. He realized he was breathing too fast, and he bent over to get a grip on himself. He needed to go back to squinting, but he couldn't. He had to know. Stepping closer again, Hudson tilted his head to get a better look at what was hiding under the fur and metal. He was, just, he was going to show himself that his crazy flight of gruesome fancy was just that. Fancy. It's, 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 there's a human in it, isn't there? Um, but it wasn't. Hudson lifted a finger and carefully extended his hand far enough to touch what was inside the ravaged fur and the exposed metal. He put the tip of his finger against the reddish material, and he jumped back so fast he lost his balance and fell against the opposite wall. It was. It was tissue. Maybe not. No, probably not human tissue, but it was some kind of bodily tissue. Who would want to terrify someone with gore like this? It couldn't be real. It's real, a scratchy voice said. Hudson scrambled back. It spoke. The, animus the animatronic spoke? 
No, that wasn't possible. Duane and Barry told him the thing was completely non-functional. Experts were going to be brought back in to work on it. And even then, they figured it was beyond the repair. If you weren't so stupid, I'll tell you more about it, the voice said. The voice was distinctive, way too distinctive. A bass voice with a burr-like rasp. Um, <laughs> Aaron Burr. Uh, the voice had a hint of a sudden accent. Hudson knew that voice. It was Mr. Atkins' voice. Hudson's drew his stick. How could Mr. Atkins' voice be coming out of this thing? Or did the voice come from the animatronic? No, Hudson didn't think so. The voice seemed to fill his head, coming more from inside his ears than outside of them. He couldn't pin down a direction. Who said that? Hudson asked. He looked around, then looked back at the animatronic. It hung on the wall, its tooth-filled mouth completely still. Still, sorry. Uh, Hudson turned his head to look up and down the wall. Stupid, the voice said again. Hudson whipped his gaze back to the animatronic's mouth. It was exactly as it had been before. Hudson stared at the mouth for several minutes. The voice didn't speak. The hallway was silent. Hudson blinked and looked down the length of the animatronic, staring at the jagged lower edge of the fur ending above exposed ankle bones. Were those bones? Nah, that was stupid. They had to be metal supports discoloured by age. Do the math, the voice said. The voice and the word math brought back a rush of memories from Mr. Atkins' algebra class. Hudson could suddenly smell the chalk in the classroom, feel his sweat-dampened jeans sticking to the hard seat of his desk. He could feel his classmates' eyes on him, feel Mr. Atkins' disdain. He wanted to run away and hide. Tears welled in Hudson's eyes, but then he remembered he wasn't a child anymore. He felt a surge of anger, and he shoved his nightstick in the animatronic's mouth. He heard a snap, a tinkle, and a clatter on the floor. He'd broken off one of the animatronic's teeth. Or had he? Was that tooth there when he first approached the thing? This is nuts, Hudson said. He reached out and grabbed the animatronic. His intention was to carry it to a closet and lock it inside. But the thing was heavier than it looked, and it wouldn't budge from the wall. Dead weight. <laughs> uh, what kind of hooks did you use? Hudson asked the absent Duane. He peered at the connections, and he couldn't figure out how to release them. Is it, is it um, spring locks, I assume? Um, well, okay, this was good, right? This meant the animatronic couldn't go anywhere. Hudson set his shoulders, turned, and strode down the hall away from the abomination hanging on the wall. He might have heard a whispered stupid as he went, but he wasn't sure and he decided to pretend he hadn't. Instead, he marched into the dining room to do his rounds properly from the beginning. Striding past the tables, he thought about that voice. He hadn't heard that voice in over ten years. He hadn't even thought about Mr. Atkin in that amount of time either. Why was he suddenly hearing a voice that sounded like Mr. Atkin? Was someone playing a prank on Hudson? Would Duane and Barry do that? Duane, maybe, but not Barry. Let it go, Hudson told himself. Maybe he'd imagined the whole thing. He had gotten himself totally worked up about this place in the last few days. He'd never taken rejection well, and his disappointment in Faith, who did not live up to her name, <laughs> uh, could have caused a little emotional crash and burn. Maybe his mind was tormenting him because he was tormenting himself for not handling Faith's question better. What would she have done if she if he hadn't gotten defensive? He could have just said, no, of course I didn't do it. Or what if he just said, did what? All innocent and made her explain her question. He could have said, that's not an easy question to answer. That would have been the most honest thing he could have said. Would she have gone out with him again if he hadn't snapped at her? Stop it, Hudson ad admonished himself. Going through these what-ifs and should-haves was like beating his head against a brick wall. Hudson went through the archway and started passing the crippled arcade games. Since he was already carrying his nightstick, he beat a rhythm on the metal and plastic and wood as he passed the game remains. He did this every night. It broke up the tedium. Tonight's drumming session wasn't typical though. As he drummed, Hudson swore he could hear singing. He stopped drumming and the singing stopped. Who was singing? Hudson took a step back and looked around the dining room. His gaze slipped past the characters on the stage and then it jerked back. The characters. They'd moved since he'd passed them. The singing started again and the characters' lips were moving. 
They were singing. That was not possible. They were statues. Hudson went back in the arcade and started rapping his nightstick more loudly on the games. He was determined to drown out the impossible singing. Before Hudson could rap on the third time in the line, though, he got another surprise. This one was not as benign. Suddenly, Hudson's nightstick was ripped from his gasp, uh, grasp sorry, and thrown across the room. It hit the wall with a thwack at the same time Hudson's head slammed down onto the scarred wooden desk under the window in his bedroom. Why isn't your homework done? Lewis bellowed. The impact was powerful and the corner of the desk that contact contacted with Hudson's temple was sharp. So he was hit with the door double with a double whammy of searing pain and a blinding stream of blood flowing down into his eyes. Stumbling back, Hudson swiped at the blood, trying to clear his vision so he could see Lewis enough to know what the man was going to do next. Lewis had been hitting Hudson for years, but this was the first time Lewis had slammed his head into something. As Hudson wiped his eyes, he rotated, staggering. But he didn't see anyone. Where was Lewis? He was gone. Hudson was alone in the arcade. Wait, wait, what, what just happened? Pressing his hand to the bleeding wound at his hairline, Hudson blinked at the arcade game in front of him, a bent and crooked alien invaders type game. He saw blood on its metal frame. He wasn't in his bedroom. Lewis didn't just slam his head into a desk. His head had been slammed into the game. Hudson looked for his nightstick. He couldn't find it, and he couldn't stop with the bleeding with his hand. He had to get back to the office. He had a first aid kit there. But was it safe? Something really weird was going on. Why did he hallucinate a scene from his childhood? A muted thud sounded from a few feet away. Who's there? Hudson shouted. He held still, listening. He heard nothing but his hitched breathing. He tried to ignore the pounding in his head so he could think. Blood trickled down the hand Hudson used, uh, held to his head. Whatever happened, he needed to bandage his wound. He couldn't just stand here. Retracing his steps through the dining room, Hudson scanned the area for a threat, but it was too dim and well shallowed for him to have a clear view of every part of the room. The tables, chairs, muted lighting and cast shadows provided too many hidey holes for anyone who might want to attack or torment Hudson. Besides, he knew no one was there anyway. He was alone in the building, which made what just happened all the more distressing. Still bleeding, Hudson rushed through the room, then he jogged down the hall toward the office. He made it there without any trouble. After closing and locking the office door, Hudson checked all of the monitors before awkwardly wiping blood from his wound and covering it first with gau gauze, gauze, I think it's gauze, and then with surgical tape. While he doctored himself, he tried to ignore the pain throbbing at his temples and he tried not to think about the monitors showing no movement of any kind in the whole building. Hudson finished his first aid efforts and sank into his chair. He looked at his bloody hands, then got up. He had to go to the restroom and get himself cleaned up. He looked around the room. Without his nightstick, he felt exposed and vulnerable. He needed a weapon. He spotted a hammer he'd forgotten to return to the supply closet after he'd used it to fix his desk a couple days before. He picked it up, hefted it, swung it, and nodded, satisfied. This would work. He took a breath, checked the monitors again, and turned to and turned toward, wait. He looked back at the monitors. He blinked and rubbed his eyes. His vision was a little blurry, probably from both the blood in his eyes and the blow to his head. Was he seeing that wrong? He leaned toward the monitor in question. No, he wasn't seeing it wrong. He was seeing what he was seeing. Where the animatronic that was supposed to be latched, immobile and trapped to the wall in the... Oh, sorry. Where was the animatronic... <laughs> Where was the animatronic that was supposed to be latched, immobile and trapped to the wall in the inner hall? Hudson flung the office door open, gripping the hammer so hard his knuckles turned white. He strode down the hall to the... Oh hell, it was gone. It really was gone. Hudson gawked at the empty hooks hanging from the wall. Hudson heard a scuffling sound behind him. He whirled. Nothing was there. Or was something there? Hiding just past that pile of character suits. Hudson pulled out his flashlight and shined it around the hallway. No, he didn't see any movement. He took a step down the hall, moving toward the bathroom. Turning in circles constantly, he tried to be aware of the entire hallway at once. He wished he had eyes in the back of his head. He made it to the men's bathroom without further incident. 
Pushing the door open, he tensed and raised his hammer. Who knew that what, what was lurking in here? Was it the mutilated rabbit waiting for him? Hudson snorted at the word rabbit. He was thinking of the animatronic as a rabbit because it made him feel better to think of it being uh, about as threatening as a teddy bear. But of course, that was just his ignorance. Stupid, the Mr. Atkin voice said. Hudson whirled. He was alone. Again, he couldn't tell where Mr. Atkin's voice came from because it was his voice. Hudson was sure of it. For once, Mr. Atkin was right. It was stupid to think of the animatronic as a rabbit. It was as much a, a rabbit as Hudson was. No, the abomination that Hudson's friends had so calmly installed this morning was not a rabbit at all. It was a robot, and it was more. Hudson was pretty sure the remains of a corpse were stuck inside the rabbit suit skeleton. He wasn't 100% convinced, but he was convinced enough. Quickly checking to be sure all the stools were empty, Hudson held the hammer with one hand while he splashed water on his free hand. He quickly realised this was a clumsy way to clean up that wasn't going to work. And after double-checking the room, he set down the hammer and started to wash his hands in preparation for cleaning up his face. He never should have set down the hammer. Hudson went from standing still to backpedalling toward the handicap accessible stool in a half blink of a second. He was by the sink, and then he wasn't. Now he was skidding across the bathroom, hauled by unseen hands toward the toilet in the bigger stool. Hudson screamed, Stop it! and tried to grab at the stool doorway as he went through it. He couldn't get a grip on it to stop his progress. He slid the few feet to, on, uh, to the toilet. Hold him down, one of the boys shouted. Get his shoulders, another one yelled. Hudson got one last glimpse of the grain linoleum floor of the boy's bathroom before he felt his head going into the toilet. He closed his eyes and his mouth just as he was submerged. Then the water swirled to the sound of laughter. Hudson flailed and thrashed and fell back into the closed door of the stool. He coughed, spit, and tried to upchuck what little food he had in his stomach. Water sluiced, <laughs> sluiced. Um, yeah, water went down his neck and trickled under his shirt. Get away from me, he screamed at the bullies tormenting him, even though he knew that yelling would spur them to do something else to him. He tensed, bracing for another assault. Nothing happened. Hudson looked around. His gaze fell on the floor, the black and white floor. He squinted at it, then put a hand on it. No grey linoleum, 